Because in times of setbacks in markets, that's a time when clients in our world are really looking at their portfolio closely. So if you can mitigate the downside in these extreme events, it's really, really helpful. And of course, government bonds in particular, to a certain extent, investment grade, really, really did deliver on that, including March 2020, of course. So that is useful, but it can't be the only solution. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. For me, the best part of my podcasting journey has been the opportunity to speak to a huge range of extraordinary investors from all around the world. In this series, I have invited one of them, namely Alan Dunn, to host a series of in-depth conversations on the topic of what it takes to be a world-class allocator. In today's world, portfolio construction is fast moving to the top of the agenda of many investors as they try to analyze and understand the riskiness of their portfolios. And with ever-increasing uncertainty around the globe, being well diversified across many different strategies and themes in your portfolio can mean the difference between ruin and survival when the next crisis emerge. The aim of these conversations is to try and understand the experiences that have influenced these highly specialized allocators and the processes they follow to harness the best returns for their clients so that we can all become better informed investors. And with that, Please welcome Alan Dunn. Thanks very much for the introduction, Niels. Today I'm joined by Alan Higgins. Alan is Chief Investment Officer of Coots Private Bank in the UK. Coots is possibly best known as being the Queen's Bank in the UK, and the private banking business there is uh, responsible for managing about £30 billion in assets under management. Uh, you're very welcome, Alan. Thank you so much, Alan. I, and I do have to jump in there. In, in that statement, I, all I can say, that's a matter of public record. I won't say yes or no. That's a matter of public record. <laughs> well, thanks for clarifying that. Um, I know you are uh, in the position of CIO and your role has um, evolved over the years. It would be great if you give us a sense of your current role today at Coots and you know, as well as that, a bit of background as to, I know you have a very long and distinguished career in the market, so maybe not the full um, uh, CV, but a, a kind of a sense on, on what brought you to your current role uh, today. Sure. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll start from the beginning, so to speak. So I started before the 87 crash. So that tells you I've been around for a long time. And uh, I had a mathematics degree. And in those days, of course, I wanted to do equities like everyone else. And they said, no, you've got a maths degree. This was actually Sun Alliance just before I joined Invesco, just very briefly. You've got a maths degree, you're doing bonds and currencies. I thought, oh, great. Um, so anyway, I had a, a really enjoyable fixed income and currency career um, that we, we could talk about. I quickly went into hedge funds, and I can talk about my experience there, working for a multi-strat hedge fund on the back of a very strong, long-only track record. Learned it's very difficult, very different. And then basically been in wealth management via Morgan Stanley and Coots. Just in terms of my current role, I still have the title Chief Investment Officer. It's a bit of a legacy title these days, just for clarity. I'm more like a Chief Global Market Strategist. I told you I started, Alan, before the 87 crash. So that tells you I've got to let the younger people come through, uh, very talented individuals coming through at Coots. And so these days I advise and mentor alongside the chief global market strategist roles. But hopefully that gives me a lot of freedom to discuss quite candidly investment strategies and capital allocation. Absolutely. And um, I mean, that's a great segue into maybe the first topic, which is, you know, you have had 35 odd years of experience in the markets and as a in CIO type roles. Has it got easier, more difficult or the same over those years, would you say? <laughs> Alan, great question. I don't think investing has ever been easy. And I think um, 
you know, I started off in fixed income and currencies. And like a lot of people, I thought I can call the treasury market. I can do some great fundamental analysis and call the US treasury market. I can call a dollar Deutschmark. If you can remember that, Alan, dollar Deutschmark, I remember it, yeah, do- dollar market. yen. I can call these currencies with fundamental oh. analysis. Uh, what I quickly re- realized is, one, I couldn't. It's very, very difficult. These are very, very efficient markets. And two, I got started to get interested in just earning the risk premium. So I've had a big bias over time. And funnily enough, I was just kind of looking into this. And, and so what do we mean by risk premium and fixed income? Well, it wasn't really corporates in those days. In fact, when I started my career, the first kind of big risk premium I saw, big risk adjusted, was Canada issuing a dollar bond in the United States. In 1986, Canada issued Canada 9s and 96, a very famous euro bond. Uh, and you earned an extra quarter of a percent over US treasuries. But step back a bit, isn't it remarkable earning 9% compound for basically mm. doing nothing um, for, for, for Canada risk? Um, but it intrigued me, this quarter of a percent premium. Yes, it's small, but really you hold this bond for 10 years and you, you compound it at quarter percent more. And I, I just saw that that was a much better way of investing is to earn a risk premium rather than trying to call a treasury market. Now, don't get me wrong, um, even today, um, I'm asked, where's the gilt market going? Where's the treasury market going? And I have a view, but I just know it's poorer quality compared to strategies that earn risk premium. Absolutely. Um, that's a very valid point. I suppose one of the challenges we have in the current markets is that risk premia have generally become compressed. You know, I suppose we've had a decade of quantitative easing and the uh, aim of QE was really to, to compress risk, risk premia and boost asset values. Do you think that approach will, of ser- searching for those risk premia is still the way to go? Or do you think now there's a bit more of an onus to try and be more active? Or is it just that you have to search uh, a bit further and further afield in terms of uh, finding a risk premium? I mean, it helps if you can search further afield. I mean, stretching it to fixed income, one of the, the obvious risk premium, where there's until quite recently, almost a behavioral aspect was high yield or junk. Mm. which, of course, Michael Milken realized the genius is that the returns are there adjusted for the risk. And to this day, there's still a lot of bias against high yield. Not many, not not a lot of investors don't want to hold it long term because obviously it draws down with equities. One, it's a risk asset. And partly the, the, when it's out of favor, the, the junk part of it is really focused on. But the facts are it has a better sharp ratio than equities. Is a very attractive. If you, if you if you put high yield into any classic optimization, the optimization will spit out have a nice high weight because of the sharp ratio. So that's one area. I would say bring it to today. Today, I mean, for the listeners, uh, Coots is very much we, we look after money for ultra high net worth clients, but also the NatWest Group. So we're in the retail space. So we're a little bit constrained in the usage space. I am very familiar with the Cayman space. We used to have a, he- a traditional hedge fund of funds even at Coots uh, back in the day. And uh, at Morgan Stanley, I was involved in alternatives and including um, some of the strategies you were involved in, trend following, which no doubt we'll talk about. But within the usage space, it's been great being a 60-40 investor, as we know, bond until the last couple of months. Um, But it's been great being a 60-40 investor. Diversifying away from being a 60-40 investor uh, not the equity side, clearly, but we can talk about the equity side, but the f- so-called 40, that is really challenging in, in, in the use of space. And we tried it and we've had some some notable failures. I'm, I'm not afraid to admit it. It's very hard to find market neutral or any kind of convexity to the downside. Uh, and of course, um, you, where, your background managed futures is one area. I saw that it, it, especially in Morgan Stanley, but um, I've been a fan of trend following ever since uh, a gentleman called Pierre Lecure opened my eyes to it um, at AB and Ambro as a, as a great way of of capturing alpha in currencies. Interesting. So, so when was that? That was back in the in the nineteen nineties. You got your yeah, first exposure so that, to, to, to trend, is it? Well, funny enough, um, at when I worked at Invesco, so I worked at Invesco, which was kind of my main first f- fixed income job, fixed income and currencies. Currencies always used to go with fixed income, 
and uh, I'll mention a few names because if they happen to be listening, there was, a, there, was, there was a guy there, Steve Prokofiev, who came from quite a quanty background and he, he'd seen trend following. So he, he introduced simple, you might remember, Alan, 10 day average, 10 day moving average, moving above the 50 day moving average. And there was enough trends in dollar Deutschmark and dollar yen then and, and, and cable and other yes. currencies. So he introduced it, but kind of went a bit quiet, a bit flat. And then when I worked at, um, I was head of fixed income and currencies at ABN Amber Asset Management, and I had a very traditional approach, some very solid people doing work. But what tended to happen is that, for example, the Australian bond specialist would also look after the Australian dollar. And uh, this guy was very, very clever. But as we know, currencies have a habit of, of making clever people looking very, very foolish. So kind of realized that wasn't working. And so we, we hired a guy, Pierre Lecoeur, who was quite well known in currency cir- circles, and he knew the theory. You want, you want to have an element of trend. You want to have an element of carry, maybe vol-adjusted carry, and, and, and have a much more discipline about it and be also two-sided. So that was my kind of first approach to a kind of quantitative approach. And then seeing action when I worked for Morgan Stanley Wealth, thank God we had some trend followers in 08, 09 to help protect yes. the downside. So you've seen it firsthand, I guess, coming going back over a couple of decades. And that's something... I think from my own experience as an allocator that you definitely see that clients who have been in these strategies in the good times and have seen them work have the staying power to stick with them in, in times that have been more difficult. And obviously, these all of these strategies go through periods of, of ups and downs. Um, so you touched on it is challenging to get away from the 60-40 in the usage space, given kind of structural constraints. If you, you know, if, if you were to take those constraints to you know put put them to one side in an ideal world what would you say to somebody who wanted to run a you know a, a liquid multi-asset portfolio who had maybe historically just based himself off a 60 40 what do you think the equivalent to the 60 40 looks like for, for for the next decade so let's cover the equity side so and i'll cover also the, the liquid space where, where we can i think on on the so-called equity risk uh, firstly we do we do embrace passive at Coots. Um, we can talk about the data. We can talk about even the kind of the very interesting research from the University of Arizona. I don't know if you've come across it. A, 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 an interesting guy called uh, uh, Mr. Bessenbinder, who's done some work about only a small number of stocks basically driving markets, which obviously means can be hard to outperform. But whether it be that, so p- passive has a role. Um, there are other areas of equity risk. Um, having a fixed income background and I mentioned the behavioural bias against um, high yield. That's one area. I'll take it to the next area, CLOs. If you mention CLOs and CLO equity to to, uh, to to some people, it's like, oh, my God, you know, that's that's tarnished. But as we know, CLOs came through 0809, unlike a lot of structured products, absolutely fine. And CLO equity is a very, very interesting, somewhat uncorrelated from equities. Obviously, there's a mark to market. Uh, a very interesting equity-like return. And when you rephrase it, because of course, a lot of these loans is private equity. Uh, everyone loves private equity right now. So mm. I often uh, go in and say, I oh, know we're not investing in loans, we're investing in senior private equity. Oh, that's okay. Uh-huh. You know, senior mm. private equity, that, that must be great. Now, it's not without its risk, but these are managed. So I, I do like that area of equity risk. But but. The real challenge, as you hint at, Alan, is the, is the so-called the other 40%, where fixed income, especially higher duration fixed income, has really done, done the job. So um, I think there is a role for CTAs. One of the issues, just speaking quite candidly, is often the feedback we get in USITS format is that it can be hard to get the key commodities component in. Because as we know, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Alan, but you know this very well, 0809, oil was super important, Right. For returns, right, yeah. for returns in 08, 09. And um, whether it be regulation, whether it be some risk aversion about putting commodities in, which would have to come in in some kind of swap, there's there's that aspect. But um, I, I can certainly see a role there. Global macro is really interesting because there's no obvious risk premium. The, the, the risk premium in, in CTAs is, is momentum, as we know, and, and simply the surprise factor of markets continuing to trend. Um, whereas the, with global macro, you're really relying on the brilliance of some individuals, which is hard. But undoubtedly, there are some firms that are semi-institutional and do it. And 
they seem to most of the time have a bearish bias, which is helpful. I mean, bearish on risk assets. Mm. Right now, some are prospering from a bearish bias towards inflation, which is helpful. Yes. You know, it'll be interesting to see how they do in a real risk off scenario. Otherwise, it can be a struggle. So, yeah, I, I'm not telling you anything that's not been on Coots fact sheets. So we're very, uh, we're very open about the holdings that we've had because it's in the public domain on fact sheets. We don't just do our top 10, but we show all our holdings. But we've been in market neutral strategies such as AQR style premier, which is more quantitative, which is having a really good comeback as we speak, but got absolutely destroyed by the underperformance of the value factor principally. Mm. Um, But I've got a lot of respect for them as a firm, a fantastic firm. But that's been the struggle. You could imagine being investing in something like that with big drawdowns, while bonds performing solidly, um, it's not a very pleasant meeting with the investment committee. No, it's tricky. I mean, this is the challenge with with alternative risk premia, isn't it? That they are um, in existence, but but time varying, isn't that right? And and we're certainly seeing that. We saw that with momentum. We've seen that with with the value factor. Um, I I know you've had that hedge fund experience in your background. You know, back in the early days, I know you worked at a uh, multi strat hedge fund. So so your experience has spanned, I guess, traditional asset management, wealth management, and the hedge fund space. Did I mean has that experience in the hedge fund? world been helpful for you as you moved you know away from asset management into wealth management would you say yes i think so i only spent two years at a a small multi-strat fund certainly small in the context of the citadels of this world uh, called orn capital set up by harold ornberg it was originally a merger arb firm that did really well in merger arb that's a an obvious risk premium making the last six or seven percent on a, t- a takeover typically uh, and then he expanded it to be multi-strat, so working to help him there. Obviously, I had a fixed income background. And and the background there is that I had, uh, the learning was I had a, and it was a team effort anyway at A.B. Ambro, of course. But A.B. Ambro, we had a very good track record, especially in European fixed income. Uh, it was where the credit markets were really opening. So my bias for receiving risk premium, and in those days... Um, EQ convergence, if you remember that, Alan, that was I when do, yeah. uh, that was when uh, the euro was coming in, and you could basically buy Italian, Greece, Ireland government bonds, etc., mm. and they all converged into euros. And I guess I did that a little bit more aggressively than some other fixed income houses, and ended up as part of a team winning a, a Lipper Prize for the fixed income fund. I mean, there was a lot going on in there. There was a, some, to be fair, there was some currency exposure going on. on. As you know, um, a fund manager that wins a prize is using doing something fairly strange. So yeah, I put my hand up. But nevertheless, you use the track record. And uh, with that, um, when Harold took us in into his multi-strat firm uh, to run a fixed income sleeve and, and generally be, be involved. And I have to admit that... Um, we thought we knew about shorting. We did a little bit. It was just when the CDS market was starting and certainly shorting government bonds for futures. And, you know, we'd done a little bit of that at, at uh, AB and Ambro. But compared to some of the traders that had come from investment banks, we frankly were a little bit green and just not as, having been a long investor then for so many, many years, just not as comfortable as shorting. So when it comes to capital allocation, I, I'm very curious about the the, the background and slightly wary of finding someone like myself. Not that it, uh, by the way, I should say, um, I mean, it's in the public domain, the track record. It was all on in the hedge fund uh, publications of the time. But it, the, the multi-strat fund compounded at a very healthy 7 or 8%. Nothing wrong with that. The issue was simply um, it was a time when the citadels of the world was compounding at 30, I believe, um, okay. and, and the like. So nothing disastrous happened. But yeah, after that, it was a great experience. It was and it gave me a lo- really understood, especially merger arb, event driven strategies. There's a very good distress team there. So uh, I remember one situation where they bought a distress bond. This is a real learning. It was British Energy. And it was, uh, it, it, there was even a Radio 4 program in the UK about it on in the business because they bought basically when energy was bombed out, they bought a British energy bond at say 10, 12, can't remember the exact numbers, and got mm. paid out over 100 because of course they'd converted into equity. And um, one of the equity holders came on to Radio 4 and complained that bond holders were getting too much money. <laughs> um, but I learned a lot about distress. And, and actually, interestingly, we're kind of seeing a little bit of that 
when we saw the Hertz bondholders convert to equity and you get windfall gains over and above the par. So distressed was a very interesting area. So yes, that was only a couple of years, but I got a really good kind of wide experience of uh, we had to convert our manager there as well, for example. So, so various risk premium being captured. Yes. And I, I guess has that experience, um, you know, a, a couple of it with all of the other experience you have helped, I suppose, in your skill set as a manager selector? Obviously, in, in, a, in a CIO type role, you've always got asset allocation decisions, but then you've got to have to populate each of those strategies with, with specific managers or whether it is, um, you know, beta type exposures or more active exposures. Um, was that helpful in terms of honing your manager selection skills? And, you know, do you, do you think that's a, a more challenging task, manager selection and asset allocation? Or is that fair to say? Alan, I think it is more challenging. It's very subtle because on the one hand, at a very superficial level, oh, I can invest in this fund. I see the track record. The people look good kind of analysis. Mm. Uh, and it's very easy to be sucked in without the detail. And I've learned over time, and I'm still learning today, the detail, the factors, exposures, the biases, uh, the potential tales. Um, it, there's a, there's a, an enormous amount of subtlety. And then to this day, struggle with how much should you account for March 2020 type performance on diversifiers, where, yes. it, whether it be merger arb, convert arb, where there's, you know, widening of spreads, you know, widening of resentment versus, you know, how much protection do you want for events like that versus more closer to zero correlation elsewhere? So you, you, there's a lot of strategies, not a lot of strategies, but the strategies that have zero or close to zero correlation over the long run, but they do have these big pop downs in environments like March 2020. So it's all very, I find it very challenging. I have to say, in my new role, I quite enjoy the advising and mentoring bit. And we've got a very strong internal team that has to look in detail at that. And yes. no surprise to, to any um, asset managers on the call um, that the, the Cooch reports are, you know, no one's listening, but they're, they're a good inch thick. If I put it simply, Alan, you know, compared, I often say, um, maybe a bit too self-deprecating, what I did was amateur capital allocation and now with the bigger team it's super professional right i like and to think that... i still pick some good managers though alan you know yeah yeah i mean it's interesting i mean you can write reams and reams of reports and uh, there's this um i think it's a uh, philip tetlock has a book on forecasting and, and one of the things he talks about it, as far as i can recall is like more information doesn't necessarily you kind of reach diminishing returns with more information that it doesn't necessarily improve the value of the forecast and you i kind of have that in the back of my mind sometimes with manager selection there is this bias to okay let's tick all of the boxes and look at everything from from every angle to give you a comfort that you're doing extensive due diligence but um but as you say it's still a very difficult decision even when you have the comfort of all of this information you still have to make a a value call um, and value is, I mean, a subjective uh, judgment. Um, what do you think is, are, are, you know, you talked about behavioral biases. What, what are the kind of biases do you think you have to keep at the fore of your mind as you're going through a manager selection decision? Well, I need to focus on my own behavioral bias. So my own behavioral bias is to want to be in strategies that are earning a risk premium, which means that, um if, if that's implemented too far without some checks, uh, March 2020, 15, 16, in 2018, it ends up in some very uncomfortable drawdowns. So that needs to be mitigated. So we have our own uh, biases. The other part is, is really where it's discretionary, just trying to, trying to understand the, the biases is very good uh, signal, I think, when you see some real self-awareness of the manager and some humility uh, of the manager. Mm. Uh, and, and that could be in the long only space, as well as the alternative space. But it, it's, it's a difficult area. And, you know, it's taken me, uh, you know, years to come to terms with my own bias, uh, let alone looking and researching and understanding other people's. And you'd made a good point there in relation to this idea of strategies can have a 
you know, low to zero correlation over time. But then that's not necessarily the same as strategies that might deliver convexity or crisis alpha in an equity downturn. So from a portfolio construction perspective, would you make a distinction between those two strategies and look to have both sets of strategies within a diversified portfolio um, or, 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 or a bias to having those kind of crisis risk offset strategies? How do you think about that? Absolutely, because um, yeah, um, because in times of setbacks in markets, uh, that's a time when clients in our world are really looking at their portfolio closely. So if you can mitigate the downside in these extreme events, it's really, really helpful. And of course, government bonds in particular, to a certain extent, investment grade, really, really did deliver on that, including March 2020, of course. So that is useful, but it can't be the only solution. Because either you're in government bonds extensively, one, or two, you're buying an awful lot of option premium. Either you're lucky, you're buying it at the right time, or you're buying it fairly continuously, which is, as we know, um, a a negative outcome. And it would go against my philosophy of kind of earning the risk premium. So a a bit of both. Uh, So I guess what I'm saying, convertible arbitrage, merger arbitrage to pick on two, if you're just going to have to accept the drawdowns, the mar- let's let's call it because it's a, it's been so recent, is and it's the poster child, the March 2020 style drawdowns. Mm. You're going to have to accept some kind of drawdown, I suppose. Where the then the manager selection of manager comes in is well, how big was the drawdown for this specific manager? Um, how well did they mitigate it? And and it's it's kind of it becomes a risk return trade-off, doesn't it, in terms of how much do they deliver in normal-ish times versus these, these, these big events. You touched on government bonds there, and, and obviously this is the big, uh, you know, question is that, that, that these strategies are, those assets were typically relied on to fill that role in the portfolio of defense and um um, protection in, in in severe kind of market stress environments, but you know in the last couple of years we've moved into this more inflationary environment, which is obviously an additional headwind for for fixed income. Um, you know you've obviously been in the markets you know o- over three decades plus, so you've seen not quite the inflation of the seventies, but certainly when you started your career, inflation was was um, at at higher levels. What's your perspective on the current inflation deflation debate? I mean, are we heading back to the 1970s or are we just into a pop higher in inflation and things will normalize or um, is it somewhere in between? Yeah, you're right, Alan. So I, I, I'm not quite old enough to see the 70s, but I did see one mini bout of inflation in the 1980s, especially in the UK, where within 18 months, this is based on RPI rather than CPI, because that's the only thing that existed then. Late 1980s, inflation went from three to 10 within 18 months. And that was the so-called Lawson boom. Uh, Nigel Lawson, not Nigella, for those uh, younger generation uh, who are more focused on the cookery, uh, her father. It was so-called Lawson boom. So interesting it was very much, of course, the great thing about looking back, it's all theories. No one knows for certain why inflation accelerated from three to 10. It was put down to basically loose money conditions. What I do know is that the data shows that bank lending was very, very strong, despite the very high interest rates. But, you know, what's remarkable is not so much the inflation, but what then the central bank, the Bank of England did about it. Sorry, the Bank of England plus the government, because the Bank of England was not was not independent then, of course. Amazingly, they took rates to 15%. Now, UK rates went to 15% twice, but they took rates to 15%, a real rate of five. You know, really extraordinary. Uh, uh, so actually crunched inflation down, as we know, one. So so I've I've seen that. If I look at the current circumstances, basically... We stand by a lot of evidence for low inflation structurally. Why? Zero interest rates in Japan for 20 years, no inflation. Uh, negative interest rates in the eurozone, uh, no inflation. A currency devaluation in the UK and low interest rates, no inflation. So whether it be demographics, the Larry Summers argu- argument about secular stagnation, technology, it sounds kind of woolly, but there's a lot of evidence for low inflation. However, without trying to sound like a two-handed economist 
we will concede, I will concede, there is something different about this time. So I never believe QE as a, as a bond investor. I never believe conventional QE generated inflation. Why? Because you can think of it almost like a, an agent. If I pick on Goldman Sachs, the Bank of England rings up Goldman Sachs and says, buy a billion of gilts. They go to an insurance company or a pension fund. Goldman Sachs is merely moving those gilts from a pension fund to the Bank of England like an agent. So there was never uh, there was never bank lending like there was in the 1980s in the US or the UK to generate the inflation. However, this time is different. One, a V-shaped recovery. So some cyclical inflation, and we know about the supply chain issues. Two, what makes me more queasy is the direct payments of money. I think the furlough scheme that we've had in the UK, and I was actually talking to someone like Denmark, it's very, uh, very interesting to see that Denmark had almost identical furlough scheme, type furlough scheme to the U UK. And of course, in the United States, they had actually magic money, where money was deposited in bank accounts. We never had that before. Um, so therefore, there is some elements of inflation. And that's why we're going through this right now. And concede that, however, two things. One, there's a lot of evidence for low inflation still. Things change, but there's still a lot of evidence. And I, I don't see that going away. So kind of in the low inflation camp. And and even more important, Alan, what are central banks going to do about it anyway? My God, you remember the phrase, take away the punch bowl? Was it Arthur, Bur yeah. Arthur Burns, right? God, when are they, you know, the, the last year they had so many opportunities to take away the punch bowl while the economy was roaring. And, and now they're doing it a little bit late, as we know, but rates where they're going to go to? Two, they're certainly not going to go back to five, six, more recently, the deputy governor of the Bank of England said explicitly that, forget Coots, the deputy governor of the Bank of England says, oh, don't worry about five, six, we're not going there. But don't you think that's remarkable? Because we come from a world of inflation two, three, rates five, six in the mm. US, UK, and similar in the Eurozone, slightly lower, obviously. That's gone. That, for me, is the most remarkable thing. Whatever happened to the real interest rate? So I'm encouraged because... Interest rates should stay very, very low. And that's because we know the interest rate sensitivity because of too much debt is just too, too high. The central bank's telling us that. So so therefore, it makes me more positive on, on risk seeking, actually, because we know that low interest rates are absolutely key for risk assets and, mm. and they're going to stay low. Markets are currently going, coming to terms with higher rates and rightly have sold off. But we're nearly through that, in my in my view. Okay, so you think we're kind of at the have have priced in a lot of um, the tightening that we'll, we we will ultimately see. I guess um, it's interesting. I mean, you're right, and that's the cons I'm not sure if it's a consensus view, but there certainly is a a sense out there that each you know, if you look at the Fed, each tightening cycle in terms of rate rises over the last kind of few decades has resulted in a peak Fed funds that's been progressively lower. And I think that's the the sense, given the the indebtedness in the economy that, that, that you talk of and the financialization of the economy, I guess. Against that, there's always the risk of regime changes or something changing in the world. Do you see anything out there that would prompt you to say, OK, well, we had this kind of low inflation baseline scenario for many years. Um, what would you need to see from a structural perspective to kind of get more uneasy about that longer term view? It would be in wages. But nevertheless, Alan, the way I'd look at it is this. What do we know? We know from two, the 2017-18 cycle, US rates got to two and three quarters. Financial conditions tightened markedly. There was loan deals that couldn't get done. Uh, and uh, entering a real severe slowdown. So we know that the, the interest rate sensitivity is, of the US and certainly the UK is much, much lower. So so the way I would look at it is, is let, let's say I'm wrong and inflation becomes a 10% problem. What does that mean? For me, that means central banks take rates to circa three, UK, US, circa, I don't know, one and a half in the Eurozone, big recession. What happens in a big recession? Inflation will absolutely crash. It's a horrible way to get rid of the inflation. It's kind mm. of, it's the new version of what I just mentioned in terms of the 1980s, you know, using 15% rates to get rid of 10% inflation. But with so much debt in the world, we know a 3% rate in the UK here would mean four, four and a half percent mortgages. Big recession coming. Yes. And, 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 and we saw it in the US. So therefore... <laughs> 
This would be the sad case, big recession. It gets rid of the inflation. Another big correction in equities, probably, um, because it ten equities crash in recessions. That's the nature of the beast. So um, we'd come through it. Of course you would. Life would go on. We'd be back at zero rates, ironically, of course, because if US, UK took rates to three, big recession, and they cut rates back to zero again. So, um, but big, big picture, it's it's a low rate environment. Interesting. Um, and that's, I, I guess, I mean, that low rate environment has been part of the you know, underpinning of the equity market rally that we we saw, you know, um, over the last decade and accelerated probably kind of from 2017 onwards. But but obviously, as we've gone into this year, um, it has, you know, we've seen a correction in the Nasdaq of, you know, going on towards 20%. Do you think because of that, then, you know, equity valuations will stay elevated, you know, relative to maybe what they might have been in the early part of your career? Yeah, so... Um you're right. Look, I think interest rates absolutely key. I think Warren Buffett put it that, um, I'm probably paraphrasing him, but he put it along the lines of interest rates act upon financial instruments, property, equities, financial assets, uh, in the same way that gravity acts upon matter. It, it's everything. And and therefore, um, low interest rates, you're absolutely right, especially long duration assets have been so important. Uh, however, um, there are areas of the equity market which trade very cheaply to this day. Uh, Japan, UK, emerging markets. It, it, we're only really talking about gro- uh, growth assets in the United States and the US in general, and some growth assets maybe in emerging markets that trade at relatively expensive conventional valuations. But when you compare that valuation to, to interest rates, it's defendable. I'm not saying it's absolutely cheap. But it's certainly defendable. This might be a nice story to put in contrast because when I started my career in Vesco, it was actually the British uh, companies called MIM Britannia that bought Invesco. Invesco now own the business. And where I learned about the power of interest rates is actually from my US colleagues because I was very, I was very young. I was very much an observer. But um, the UK operation, very good fund managers, was just very conventional at the time, very long equity. Uh, always wanted to be long equity within a balanced perspective um, because that had worked in the 1980s. Absolutely worked. But coming into the 87 crash, our colleagues at, in um, Invesco Atlanta had something called, I'm going to call it the flex indicator. If anyone actually worked there and is listening to that, please come on and correct me and say it wasn't called the flex, it was called the tilt. But anyway, it was a very simple quantitative uh, early quantitative measure of the valuation of bonds. I think they used corporate bonds rather than treasuries, corporate bonds to dividend yields and dividend in the, in the States. And dividend yields was, were important back then because you didn't have the buyback kind of regimes that we have today. Uh, and I always think it in terms of IBM, which was the market leader. As 1987 was going on, heading into the crash of October, basically it was a bond bear market a very severe bond market. No doubt, Mm. Alan, your trend followers were making buckets of money from that. So bonds were selling and selling off in in, in, in 1987. And us in London, I was just observing the fund managers staying long, staying long equities. Our colleagues in Atlanta were looking at their, basically their their flex model, I want to call it the tilt model. And it was basically saying, sell equities, buy bonds, sell equities, buy bonds. Because it got to the stage where you could buy, for example, IBM 10-year corporate bonds at 10%. And I want to say the dividend yield on IBM was like one, one and a quarter. So you had 10% contractual from IBM versus one, one and a quarter, which was discretionary. Okay, equities is a growth asset. We, we all know that. So it's not just that. But they went into the 87 crash, something like 85% bonds, mainly corporate bonds, because the US was very much a corporate bond uh, investor at the time, and only 15% equities, something like that. And obviously did tremendously well in contrast to us poor souls in London. And that really opened my eyes at a, you know, as an observer and mm. also being forced to do the CFA exam anyway and learn this theory. Mm. And uh, it's a version of the Fed model, right, in a way, comparing yeah. bond yields to, to equity yields. And contrast that with today, you know, you've still got, okay, when you analyse the US market, you need to look at the earnings yield mm. rather than the dividend yield because dividend yields are are dwarfed by or, or at least matched by buybacks. Um, but that's still very attractive 
especially as a growth asset compared to cash and treasuries. So that gives me some comfort for today that um, that equities are the place to be. And I would add something because I, I know you like a book recommendation. I'm going to come on to that, mm-hmm. um, a book of the time. Where do equities really go wrong? Really, really go wrong from, from, from multiple generations. When you pay completely the wrong price, and, and I'm sure you know what I'm going to be talking about, Japan. And um, I'll talk about the book earlier, but I was with a house at the time, very good house, but they were very, very pro-Japan, very bullish. And I remember Andrew Smithers, a really good analyst coming in and just pointing out the valuation as as the boom went on in Japan in the 1980s. And he was so right. And again, I'm just the quiet person at the back, just studying and learning from, from this. But provided you don't pay 80 times earnings, by the way, IBJ, if you remember that old name, I do, Inter- yes. Inter- 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 Industrial Bank of Japan was on 150 times earnings. Um, the dividend yield was for nothing. And by the way, at one stage, as Japanese yields rose, JGB, 10-year JGBs went to 7%. Uh, so you had 80 times earnings competing with 7% contractual. But if you think about that 80 times earnings, why is that so bad? Well, if you pay the wrong price for a market, the market halves, it's still on 40 times earnings. The market halves again, it's on 20 times earnings. It corrects today and it's finally at 13 times earnings. You have had earnings growth in Japan, but the earnings growth in Japan has not been able to offset that kind of once in a lifetime, horrible devaluation. Mm. So as long as investors can avoid that scenario, and mm. but of course to get there, there will be, have to be a boom in some market. And we're not there in the United States at all. Obviously, we're not there in the rest of the world, but we're nowhere near there in the United States at, you know, circa 20 times earnings. Right. Yeah. I mean, there had been that view maybe going into the start of this year. I know people like Jeremy Grantham had been suggesting it it had been a three standard deviation, you know, move away from trend. And, I, you know, you're getting to this point that, you know, you're alluding to is that, you know, interest rates anchor uh, valuations. So, you know, you could say, well, stocks don't look that expensive relative to bonds, but obviously if bonds ever adjusted, so if you, if bond yields ever did move back higher, now you're saying it, it won't happen because of the debt levels. But obviously, I, I guess it, that w- might be a scenario where you might have a different view. If, if US 10-year yields were to go back to 4% or something, then that would put everything in a different light, I, I would imagine. Is that is that fair? I think that's very fair. I mean, I think we can see... We know how important the interest rate level is, absolutely, and the, and the bond yield level is. So in a bearish scenario, I think it would be brief where where bond yields go significantly higher. Then sometimes to explain it to private clients, in, in simple, I, I explain it in simple terms, you've got more competition for equities. You can mm. earn 4% contractually uh, from a, a relatively low risk investment. Obviously, today you can get 4% in high yield, which is a different story. So, um, yeah, that is the bear case. Um, But um, I I see that, honestly, Alan, as as somewhat unlikely. With all of that in mind, we've touched on a few different themes here. You know, inflation, is it going to be persistent or not? Or how high rates can go, valuations, etc.? And we, you know, earlier we talked a bit about diversifying strategies. You know, l- looking ahead for the next um, kind of decade or so, from from a macro asset allocation portfolio perspective, do you, you know, w- when you're advising the team at Coots, do you say, well, okay, we've got a fairly high conviction on this scenario or that scenario, or do you say, well, you know, it's very hard to say what the next ten years are going to hold. We're just going to try and you know, push the odds slightly in our favour. I mean, how do you think about that process? You know, you mentioned the, the, the lengthy research reports the team produce. Do you, I suppose, take ag- aggressive maybe is the wrong word, but do you take um, concentrated bets or do you try and diversify or how do you bring all of that um, uh, research together in terms of the po- portfolio construction process? So um, being diversified in manager selection does have some attributes, as we know, is in the USIT space. I've been arguing for, for ages that T plus three liquidity is just crazy. And we know there's been some casualties in the USIT space and um, we don't ask for it. It's just the market. And I understand for 
you know, very small investors works. But when you're at Coots and own hundreds of millions of a fund, that can be problematic. But turning to your question, I do encourage the team to be longer term. To be fair, their remit is more tactical. But what I, I do encourage them is this concept of, is there a risk premium in mm. certain areas? As we look beyond bonds, how reliable do you feel? Can you put up with the March 2020 drawdowns? And when it comes to global macro, where selected managers do have protection against drawdown, negative correlation, I will often say to the team, just make sure that this manager has been explicitly short equities, at least some sometimes. In the use it space, there's a lot of, I would call, kind of put some, some good funds, good, good funds for savers, but fit well less for us in the sense that they are strategic long equities, say with a 25% delta, circa 25% long equity risk. And I understand that as a kind of offering to, you know, my father, for example, as a perfectly good investment because you do want to be long equity risk in the long run. Everything I've been talking about on this podcast it indicates that. However, for Coots and others looking to put something like that in the portfolio, if it's permanent, it becomes problematic. Hmm. So encouraging them to, if they are going to go down the global macro space, to not pick up this kind of embedded long equity beta. To be fair, um, the team is experienced. They've been around a lot. Um, and, and they know this already. Um, you could just say, um, I'm, I'm there um, keeping them honest. Very good. I know you also have a role that you are involved with a firm called 1848 Partners alongside your role in Coots, which I believe is more focused on family offices. Is, is that right? Yes. Yeah, so I've done a few non-execs um, in the past, you know, all, as you can imagine, a big company, all have to be approved. Firstly, I worked, which is very unlikely for the Nestle pension schemes, uh, their in-house manager, really, really, you know, you see the excellence of the culture of Nestle, actually. This is not a recommendation, but there's a reason why it's been an excellent share to own, the in-house pension schemes. And then more recently, alongside some charities, I've worked with 1848, and they're in a bit of a different space to Coots because it's primarily um, European families. But one of the advantages is all professional clients, whereas Coots is very much in the retail space. So uh, you kind of can almost say it's, it's a no excuses allocation portfolio because we can look at anything and, and the team does look at anything. I'm just on the investment committee there. Again, advising, mentoring, a, a really fantastic, uh, I'll call him young because everyone's young compared to me, uh, CIO, mm. Ed Clive, who's got a really excellent mindset where we share a kinship is let's let's kind of earn that risk premium over the long run. They take an endowment style of, approach. They're very much growth investors and excellent in what they do. But when they can look at diversifiers, and protection, they can, of course, unlike me, look beyond the use its world. So they can look at um, trend following in its purest form. I, I often yeah. call it the Cayman form. I know, I know it's not all in Cayman. S some d uh, systematic macro, some merger arb where you don't have the constraints of use its. I'm sure many listeners know this, but most equity strategies can work in a use its space, but there's, there's still some restrictions. So yes, they can have a much wider a balance of of what I would call diversifying strategies, but they have a different mentality anyway. They very much want to be growth investors and earn the equity risk premium for their clients over time. I mean, they do have balance mandates as well, but basically want to focus on growth, which is, which is uh, and and they do a great job in that space. And it sounds, you know, you touched on it's kind of more of a more like an endowment model. Is that kind of that? Yale Swenson type approach with the with the equity bias, um, but some level of hedge fund strategies uh, coupled with that that growth mindset is that the, the the general philosophy. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, um, the Yale approach obviously was genius, and uh, David Swenson, who started it, did so well on the. You know, I think people now realise it wasn't just the strategy; it was the capital allocation to the individual managers which was absolutely mm. superb, and uh, obviously. And um, they have great relationships because one thing which is, you know, can be quite curious, once you, especially when you start down the venture side and to a certain extent also private equity, is that um, uh, they don't need our capital. 
Uh, they need some capital, but they, ha- I guess another way of phrasing this is there's, there's no shortage of really esteemed long-term capital providers. So the challenge that the 1848 team is, is investing and also working with uh, basically some of these venture firms, private equity firms, these very, very interesting providers and getting allocations. And they're pretty good at that. They're very, very well connected. So that's that's the other part of capital allocation, which you don't really see in the USITS world where you see it, uh, uh, only a very little bit, the odd closed fund. But generally, uh, a couple of hundred million from Coots. Yes, thank you very much. Whereas you try doing that in um, in California VC world, uh, you know, it, it, go away politely would be yes. you'd be told. <laughs> but I suppose the flip side of that is it, it has been a widely replicated model as well. And you know, you you look at any of the big endowments across the US, you know, the they all seem to be, you know, heavily invested in PE VC these types of of, of approaches. Is there a risk that you know, you know, money's typically follows the returns? Is that what we've seen in this whole area of privates, be it private equity or private debt or private credit? That that you know they've had a great decade. You've had very favorable macro conditions. Is there a risk to those strategies? Yeah, uh, Alan, that's a very uh, fair uh, point. Uh, yeah. Mm. Sorry, sorry, I jumped in over you there, Alan. Yeah, it's a very fair point. There is a huge amount of capital going in, and as you know already. Um, un- I mean, unlike public markets, there's a huge dispersion of returns uh, between various managers. So manager selection becomes even more important in this space. You're absolutely right. And uh, the team certainly are not blind to that at all. But fundamentally, for locking up your money, as you do in private equity or um, whether it be private debt, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, you do you do you do earn that liquidity premium, Alan. You you and I know how hard it is to generate returns it, mm. it, anywhere. I told you from the early days from being a bond investor. I certainly know how hard it is to call the treasury market or dollar yen ridiculously hard. Therefore, if you're going to earn an extra return just from locking up your money, well, you know that's a little bit easier than saying where ten year treasuries are going. I mean, there's some great macro funds I can. Get this can get ten-year treasuries and more subtle derivations on that, but I'm much more in the camp of where I can. Sadly, we with retail clients at Coots, we can't do that very easily. Um, but I'm much more in the camp of yes, earn the risk premium from locking up your money. It's a good thing for clients. Very good. Just I suppose shifting gears a little bit. You know, you're obviously been you've been involved in investment teams and investment processes in multiple organizations over the years and you know every business seems to have an investment committee and you know there's pros and cons to these uh, approaches i guess you know you can have the the benefit of diversity of thought but equally people worry about groupthink in in investment committees etc having been part of a, of a number of different investment decision making bodies has that um taught you anything about what's a good process versus a bad process or are there any particular pitfalls that people should think about when constructing a good investment process so it it does come down to the individuals and i mean it in this sense first and foremost i would say small number of decision makers for the overall portfolio uh, Mm. setting strategy and then for subcomponents that works well however it's super important to be inclusive at Coots, where we have, you know, 20 or 30 strong team, a small number of decision makers, actually four at the moment, but very important to listen to the views of the other members of the team and take them into account and take them into account very seriously. That has real clarity. I like that. And where I've seen it go wrong in my career is either lack of clarity. So who's actually making the decision here? Are we all looking for some kind of consensus? or simply just too many people involved. And you tend to get groupthink. I suppose where I've seen it fail the most is, um, I mean, there's a lot of news around at the moment, but when you have a lot of people involved, it tends to therefore go to the news as opposed Mm. to long-term capital allocation. Because we're all driven to the news, it's so interesting, and it can sometimes be heartbreaking even, but it can affect decision making, I find, when you have a large number of people. So keeping that decision making team small 
whilst making sure either the members of the investment committee, and they can be external, like myself, are taken into account. And there can be some very, very good investors coming through. Over, over my career, I've seen, seen a lot of uh, young people move, go on to some really great things, making sure that their view is is taken into account really promptly and, and listened to carefully and analysed and given good feedback why maybe a voting committee member said no. It, it's, it's a hard balance. It really comes down to people management at the end of the day. Interesting. And, and I guess it sounds like that's become an increasingly important part of your role in, uh, in Coots is not just the investment side, but mentoring and, and uh, working with the team from that perspective. Have you learned anything of interest in, in terms of you know, that challenge? It's been a theme that's come up with some of our other guests that they've been in the markets and investments for a long time. And very often, it's not necessarily the people who've got the investment skills that, that are the best at managing investment teams. What's your perspective on that? Yeah, I, I think that's right. I, I think um, I was—I think I was 28 years old, and I, I left Invesco because a Japanese individual working for Daiwa International Capital Management, Daiwa Securities, essentially, Tanaka-san, took a chance on me and made me head of fixed income. Why? I don't know. You have to ask him because I was ridiculously young. Um, maybe I just passed the CFA because the Americans made me do it, and that impressed him anyway. Um, so I've been involved with leading investment teams from from a long time. And I, I certainly you know, learned a lot of lessons along the way. But telling is is much, much harder than kind of winning hearts, hearts and minds. If you just tell the approach, tell you do this, do mm. this, do this, do this. So interestingly, with my current role, where I've, I've given up line management, if, if you like, and now I'm, I'm truly trying to win hearts and minds, because my official role now is, is, uh, advisor and mentor, chief global strategist, if you like, an advisor and mentor. I have to win hearts and minds. I can no longer tell. And I, mm. I guess that um, even though, so interestingly, since I've been doing this kind of a new role, I've been realizing, God, I did rely a bit too much on tell. And it's, it's, it's forced me in this, in this role to win hearts and minds a bit more and uh, a softer approach. And uh, I don't know, you'd, you'd have to talk to my colleagues, but uh, I'm still there, I guess. So they still <laughs> appreciate me. Very good. I know you you are were, are itching to give us some book recommendations by, by the sounds of it. Um, but it, we, we've we talked for going on an hour, so it's probably a natural segue into, into that element. Um, you know, for people who are developing their careers in investing, asset allocation, investment strategy. You know, you've, you've been in the markets a long time. One, any, any, any book recommendations? And two, any other uh, thoughts, advice, uh, recommendations for people to improve their skills in asset allocation and investing? So, I, I, f- firstly, I mean, sign up for almost anything. And whether it be podcasts, um, whether it be an economist coming to the office, if I've been successful <laughs> at all, it's been turning up. Um, mm. And because it, it's very easy to be lazy and I said, oh, someone's coming in to talk about, uh, I don't know, the European economy. Oh, it's dull. Uh, but go to the meeting. It's, it's amazing what snippets you can get from nearly all meetings. Podcasts like this are very interesting. I, I was very interested in uh, your previous discussions. So again, learning, you know, how the state of Hawaii manages money. Um, mm. you know, some, some interesting insights there before I go to books, kind of genius, long-term investor in the high yield space, distress best Howard Marks from Oak Tree. He releases uh, something every couple of months. And what I like about his approach is that again, he, his approach is stop trying to time the markets, take in the risk premium. But then when something big happens, well, for him, it's probably typically launch a new distressed fund, but mm. I like that idea of always being investing. Always, always be invested, earn the risk premium, and then pounce when something happens. But a couple of books, because I mentioned Japan, because it's a book, it's probably a bit under the radar book by Christopher Wood called The Bubble Economy. So it's about Japan. But I, I think it's important for all p- participants to say, right, okay, this equity oriented strategy, because let's face it, most of us as investors will have an equity oriented strategy. I want to make sure it doesn't really go wrong. And that tells you where it really went wrong both in actually real estate and equities in terms of the bubble and the kind of valuations you saw and and their subsequent. Uh, What else? A very good recent book, Trillions by Robin Rigglesworth. 
on the rise of the passive industry. Uh, a lot of the managers on here will be hating that, but it's still interesting. And, the, and there's some nice bits about the quant space, the likes of Dimensional are mentioned in there. And then for someone who's in my world, who has to especially talk to individual investors, but also to certain instit institutional investors, Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. It's a really good book of understanding why to this day when there's a big crash, why do we see we're sick in our stomach? You know, we feel it. I mean, I said I started before the 87 crash. So I've seen four of these now. I still mm. feel sick in my stomach when they happen. Why? You know, and that's a really good book about the psychology of, of losing money. And of course, with our phones these days, we're looking at our valuations all the time. It's terrible. But uh, well, why, uh, so those why, three, why, I'd give you. Why, why, on the last point, why is that? Is it just, I suppose they call it loss aversion, but is exactly there something right. more than That's just our makeup. It's our makeup, Alan. I think you're right. It is loss aversion. Uh, and uh, I mean, I could tell you, I mean, I've, I've met some, some of the most intelligent people, you know, uh, uh, physics who know more about the, the, the risk and, and the, the fault of normal distribution than I do, who've sold the company and made millions. And, and they say, I just can't get it. I can't get why I feel so bad when I put 40 million in and it's now worth 39.7. <laughs> I, I hate it. And, and I said, welcome to the club of investing. It's really hard to shake it. It is indeed. Well, thank you very much for coming on, Alan. It's been uh, fascinating to look back over 35 odd years of your career and, and to get the benefit of your insight. So very much appreciate you uh, coming on to speak to us today. Thank you very much, Alan. I really enjoyed it. Great. With, with that, I'll pass it back to Niels. Thank you so much, Alan and Alan, for a very interesting and fun conversation. I loved hearing about Alan's interest in finding out how to earn a risk premium in the early part of his career, and of course about his experience and love for trend following, and as he puts it, the surprise of market's ability to trend. Now, it was also very helpful to hear his view on what the 60-40 portfolio will look like in the next decade and the value that risk mitigation brings to a portfolio but also the fact that it is simply not enough anymore. So much value being shared today by Alan in my view, so make sure you go and follow both of the Alan's work, because as you can tell from today's conversation, it is so important that you understand how to build a well-diversified portfolio, and we really look forward to sharing many more of these insights as our series continue. From Alan and me, thanks so much for listening. And we look forward to being back with you on the next episode. And in the meantime, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.